It was the worst single atrocity the Troubles visited on the streets of Belfast. 15 dead, 16 injured. It seemed to be whenever he closed his eyes, he was back under the rubble again. It never left him. 40 years later, the legacy of that devastation has returned to challenge today's chief constable. A new report says the police investigation was biased against the victims. But Matt Baggett won't accept its findings. So is the chief constable refusing to right or wrong? All of a sudden, Matt Baggett jumps on. That was a coarse smack in the mouth we got. Or is the chief constable just resisting a move to rewrite history? Did he make his displeasure clear? Oh, yes, I did. Has this been a public relations disaster, Chief Constable? Tonight on Spotlight, the 1971 bombing of McGurk's Bar has embroiled Matt Baggett in one of the biggest rows of his 18 months in charge of the PSNI. The Chief Constable is under pressure after rejecting a police ombudsman's report which found the RUC guilty of investigative bias. The families of the dead want acknowledgement of a flawed investigation. The Chief Constable's refusal has caused controversy and the fallout has reopened old divisions over policing. December the 4th, 1971. The Troubles were poised to enter their bloodiest phase. A UVF gang was on its way to a Catholic-owned bar near the centre of Belfast, carrying a parcel packed with gelignite. The bomb was placed in the doorway and its fuse lit. It was a Saturday night and people were enjoying a drink, unaware mass murder was seconds away. It's away. The bomb exploded with devastating impact at around 8.45. Reports at the time estimated between 20 and 50 pounds of explosives had been used, enough to reduce McGurk's pub and its upstairs living quarters to a hill of rubble. Rescuers clawed out bodies in a cloud of smoke and dust. The ages of the 15 people killed ranged from 13 to 73, and at least 16 others were injured. Even the, the low rubble from the front, that's right, keep passing the rubble back. Gerard Keenan has good reason to remember that night clearly. I was 13 years of age. Uh, I was men with two brothers at the time, and more far away in the town. My father, he had just retired, and he took my mother out to do a wee bit of shopping for Christmas. When I was in the house that night, I heard this massive explosion. And it just shook the house. So I looked at the door, seen people running. What's going on? He suddenly said, my Kirk's barbers blew up. So I went down, stood on the barrack wall, and watched everybody pulling at their bar hands, pulling everything off that thing to try and get people out as quick as I could. I just said to myself, how can anybody survive us? Nobody knew how many people was in the bar at the time. Nobody knew nothing. Now, I had no idea my more far was in that bar until the next day. The bomb had been placed in the porch at the Great George's Street entrance. Most of the dead were feet away in the main public bar. They were Philip Gary, Francis Bradley, David Milligan, Robert Spotswood, Thomas Kane, James Smith, Thomas McLaughlin and Edward Lawrence Kane. Three other victims were in the lounge. Kathleen Irvine and Gerard Keenan's parents, Edward and Sarah. The remaining fatalities had been in the upstairs living quarters. Philomena McGurk, the bar owner's wife, and her 14-year-old daughter Maria had just returned from church. Also, Mrs McGurk's brother, John Colton, and the youngest victim, 13-year-old James Crummy, a school friend of the McGurk children. My father-in-law was... Jumbo Smith was his nickname. He got G James Smith was his official title, but he was Jumbo Jumbo to everybody who knew him. I was asked to go down to the the, the, 
the mortuary at the time in Lagenbank Road to identify, to do a formal identification of my father-in-law. I'll never forget what I've seen because it's not like you see on television. Uh, I was able to identify him. He was one of two coffins of the 15 people that were killed that was open. I was able to give a good identification of him, but I've got to say I wouldn't repeat some of the things that I've seen there. Official documents from the time reveal it was the IRA who were uppermost in the minds of the authorities. It's this paperwork, some of it only recently uncovered, which all these decades later helped to shape the conclusions reached in the police ombudsman's report. Those drinking inside the main part of the bar or living above it didn't have a chance. The bomb exploded without any warning. The three-storey building collapsed like matchwood into a pile of rubble and almost as quickly that caught fire. Within hours, suspicion about who was responsible pointed towards the IRA. The RUC compiled its first report stating the bomb had been in a suitcase left inside McGurk's, presumably to be picked up by a member of the provisional IRA. The so-called own goal theory came into circulation. It was quickly fed to the media. Newspapers in Belfast, Dublin and London described an IRA plan gone wrong. The RUC was quoted as saying the bomb was brought into the bar by an IRA man. It's quite difficult when you come across some of this and repeating it later that, you know, five, allegedly five people were in the bar standing over someone who was given a demonstration of how to make a bomb. And that bomb blew up and these five people were blown to smithereens. Now this was in official documents. And then to discover the exact same wording that was in this official internal report was published in a national newspaper. And you say to yourself, who leaked that? Two days after the explosion, Northern Ireland's Prime Minister, Brian Faulkner, told the government there was a strong likelihood it was an IRA bomb, and he asked the RUC to check the backgrounds of the dead and injured. But the notion this was an IRA own goal was contradicted by the evidence of the only real eyewitness, a boy named Joe McClory, who gave police clues pointing to a different story. Whereabouts did he put the bomb? Was it on the Queen Street door or the other door? The other door. McGurk's was bombed on Joe McClory's ninth birthday. This is him today. He says he will never forget that night. I just seen somebody in the hallway. I was just crouching down. I was doing something. I seen like a fizz. It was a bomb, so I was running around the corner. I didn't see his face, I just seen a bag of him. And he just, he just got in the car and he just drove on down. I remember the wee sticker was in the back of the window, the Union Jack sticker. At the time, he gave the RUC statements about what he had seen. What made you think that the police believed what you were saying? I didn't tell them. Despite his evidence, the authorities stuck to the IRA line. A secret army document stated there was a strong suspicion the bomb was carried into the bar by one of the customers. But that didn't fit the profile of the pub. McGurk's was an old-style bar occupying a corner site in North Belfast at the junction of Great George's Street and North Queen Street. It was owned and run by Paddy and Philomena McGurk, who lived on the premises with their four children. Swearing and talk of politics were discouraged among the regulars, and customers felt the IRA link was dubious. Paddy McGurk allowed people to come in to transfer a bomb. I, I says, there wouldn't be anybody with extreme Republican views could even express them in Paddy's bar. I, he wouldn't have allowed it. He was a, what he would call a gentle man. Hours after he was pulled from the rubble, Paddy McGurk went on TV and forgave the men who killed his wife and only daughter. I wish this, this sacrifice to be offered up, that peace may prevail in the community, that it wouldn't cause friction. And furthermore, that I, as a good book says, Father, forgive them. John McGurk was 10 years old when his father's pub was bombed. He was buried in the wreckage. 
I would ask anybody to just think of them losing not only their, their wife, their daughter, their brother-in-law, their entire business and absolutely every piece of belongings that, that he had, we, we escaped with what we stood in. While the RUC inquiry did not officially rule out Loyalist involvement, it could often the wrong foot by suspecting the IRA, who were responsible for most of the bombings at the time. During the follow-up security operation at McGurk's, the IRA opened fire on police and soldiers during serious disorder nearby, fatally wounding an army major and injuring two RUC officers. Initial detective work was frustrated against this backdrop. And try and get into a steering I've heard it said that there should have been door-to-door -door inquiries and other things of this sort. It would have taken three battalions of soldiers to do that, and even then they would have been rioting for days. It just was impossible in the circumstances at the time to carry out anything remotely like a, a normal investigation. It was chaos, really, and the death toll was mounting. And really it, it began with McGurk's, because it, that led on to 1972, which was the worst year of the Troubles, with almost 500 people killed. I always said to myself afterwards, if people seen what I've seen, there'd be no more bombs. Sadly, uh, when we were doing the funeral, went up the road towards the cemetery. A bomb went off, and I just remember saying to myself, so much for that thought, no more bombs. The families of those killed felt they suffered twice over. Not only were their loved ones murdered, but they believed they were tainted by the authorities, who wrongly suspected some victims of involvement in the actual bombing. Pat Irvine's parents, John and Kitty, were in McGurk's that fateful night. Her mother was killed, her father survived. Later, he was interviewed beside the coffin. Pat Irvine has never seen the footage of that interview before. And I was trapped with beams across my chest and the gas and the flames is coming in close to me. If people believe that there's a, a hell, <laughs> I can see it. It was a day, it was a terrible day. This is a hell, should be caught in today. This, this is there. I was just standing just in front of my daddy when he was making that statement. I'm glad it is, I'm glad it was done. You know, it's, it's this is our history. You know, this is something that I need to see and my sisters and brothers need to see and the rest of the family need to see. You know, it's part of us. It will never leave us. He very rarely spoke about it after that interview. But at night, I remember at night as a child, waking up, listening to my daddy, the screams of my daddy. And I remember one evening getting up to use the bathroom and I looked into his room and my granny, she was 80 odd years of age. She was cradling him in her arms like a baby, telling him not to worry, everything was all right. It seemed to be whenever he closed his eyes, he was back under the rubble again. It never left him. Pat Irvine thinks the family's pain has gone on for too long. We do want closure, but there's a lot of truth that needs to become out. We need to know why the, why the stories were put out in the first place, why the lies were put out. Um, Maybe these people are dead, but bringing the truth to the front will help us and help us bring closure. A claim of responsibility for the bombing came from a little known group called the Empire Loyalists. Both Loyalists and Republicans were mentioned in the scraps of intelligence that came the RUC's way, but the investigation seemed focused on the IRA. Two Republicans were interned in connection with the bombing, but it was not until 1976 five years after the attack, that the net began to close on those responsible. New intelligence information named five loyalists in connection with the bombing. A UVF member was arrested a year later, initially for questioning about a different murder. During his interview, he confessed to the McGurk's bombing. The UVF member was convicted at Crumlin Road Courthouse in 1978. He was freed 15 years later. 
There is no record of the other four suspects ever being questioned about the bombing. Despite the court case, the bereaved families feel the myth about McGurk's has never truly been put right. Even though he was convicted, it made no difference. The lies had been set in stone and everybody just thought that that was it, it was an IRA own goal and that the people who were in it were responsible for their own deaths. McGurk's bar was never rebuilt. Today, the site of the bombing is covered by the West Link. The new Ombudsman's report is not the first time the original RUC investigation has been held up to scrutiny. In 2008, a report by the Historical Inquiries team hinted at a skewed RUC inquiry. In the words of the report, the RUC investigation considered all relevant lines of inquiry but may have attributed more significance to the potential involvement of Republican paramilitaries than the balance of evidence supported. Eight-year-old Joseph McClory the government took the HET report as an opportunity to set the record straight. Its apology was clear and direct. We are deeply sorry, not just for the appalling suffering and loss of life that occurred at McGurk's Bar, but also for the extraordinary additional pain caused to both the immediate families and the wider community by the erroneous suggestions made in the immediate aftermath of the explosion as to who was responsible. Such perceptions and preconceived ideas should never have been allowed to cloud the actual evidence. The families seized the moment, lodging a complaint about the RUC inquiry with the police ombudsman. Last July, Al Hutchinson was ready to publish his findings, but they dismayed the families and he withdrew that report from publication. It contained factual errors, in one instance, placing Jared Keenan on a list of the dead. Well, first, many of them, obviously, on the top of the death list, we know more and far. Certain things, flaws here and flaws are, dates wrong. I did not treat the families fairly well. We had about five errors, factual errors in the report, and there's a nuance of the language. Uh, so I agreed to withdraw it, meet with the families, receive their input, and uh, that launched a, a revisit of the will of the old report, established a new team to look at it. The withdrawn report essentially cleared the RUC because it did not support the allegation that police had failed to conduct a thorough investigation. That also infuriated the families. They saw it as a retreat from the Paul Goggins apology and they demanded a new report from Al Hutchinson. He was very professional in that he started engaging with the families, hearing their concerns, looking at the evidence that they had produced. Kieran McHart, a grandson of a McGurk's victim, found evidence pointing to the existence of a high-level RUC briefing document produced on December the 16th, 1971, two weeks after the bombing. Forty years after it was written, it remains classified. But steered in the right direction, the police ombudsman's investigators were able to see the document. For the ombudsman, the new evidence was significant. It revealed the RUC incorrectly believed that two of those killed were IRA members. In all, the Ombudsman followed up nine new lines of inquiry, which resulted in a second report published two weeks ago. This time, the RUC was not absolved. Al Hutchinson's key finding was that the original investigation had been undermined by a bias towards the IRA own goal theory. Your first report says um, your office cannot substantiate the allegation police failed to conduct a thorough investigation. That appears to be a long way from finding in the second report investigative bias, does it not? No, it isn't really. Uh, what, what happened in the intervening time when we went to revisit uh, both documents, witnesses produce uh, some new evidence, particularly a critical intelligence summary of the 16th of December, clearly showed that the investigative bias, which is personal, preconceived, situational, uh, unconscious bias, uh, showed up from the very beginning. The Ombudsman's about turn drew claims he had been railroaded into changes by the relatives and organisations supporting them. 
the families went back and based on the facts, on nothing else, they said, you must look at this again. You got it wrong. Does the difference between the first and second Ombudsman's report not demonstrate that organisations like yourself and the families perhaps got at the Ombudsman and got him to change his findings? I mean, we would encourage the belief that families should get at the Ombudsman and get at the, the historical inquiries team and any other statutory body whose duty it is to investigate wrongdoing. We simply ask people to look at the facts. We, we don't ask them to, to, to look at propaganda or anything else, simply the facts. The families were delighted by the Ombudsman's revised findings, but the relation was short-lived. Well, that morning when we got that report stating that our loved ones were innocent, we were with them in. Now, all of a sudden, Matt Baggett jumps on. That was a coarse smack in the mouth we got. That's an insult. So it is an insult. Chief Constable Matt Baggett issued three statements on the Ombudsman's report within 24 hours. And while he stated unequivocally that none of the victims was in any way involved in the bombing, he disputed the key finding of bias. He said other reports reached differing judgments and have not concluded there was evidence of investigatory bias. That puts him directly at odds with the Ombudsman. I want to talk about how the Chief Constable has, has responded. Um, he makes reference to other reports um, making uh, different judgments. Do you know what he's referring to? No, I don't. Uh, we are the only organisation that comments on the police action, so I'm not clear what he's referring to. When he says that, um, is he inferring, do you think, that you got it wrong? I'm not sure. Uh, you, you would actually have to ask him uh, what he means. I'm mystified by the comments. I'm led to believe that on the Friday before publication, uh, there was an 8 a.m. meeting at police headquarters, and this was characterised as a rather fiery encounter between the two offices. Uh, we did meet. Uh, I, I suppose uh, that that's all I would say about it. Did he make his displeasure clear? Oh, yes, he did. Matt Baggett declined an interview request from Spotlight. His office also said he could not answer any questions we posed because of an undertaking he gave to the families following a meeting with some of them last week. That meeting has not drawn the sting out of this controversy. It spilled over into the policing board and reopened all divisions over policing. I was born in Rare, 200 yards from McCurk's Bar. I worked with a number of individuals on the docks who died in McCurk's Bar. I knew the families, and still do. The comments made by yourself were a serious, serious disappointment to those families. It's important that single incidents are not used in some sort of Nazi propaganda way to dismirch an entire force. Chief Constable, do you accept things have been badly handled? Can I just say, I've met with the families and their representatives and I've uh, been very clear in respect to their wishes that our conversations and my comment on the report at this stage will remain strictly private and that's something I'm going to respect and that's my position at this stage, so thank you very much. Has this been a public relations disaster, Chief Constable? Once again, opinion seems to be dividing along familiar lines. I've said to him he needs to reflect on that and to move forward and make progress on the basis of dealing with those families on the basis of integrity and with the mind of building confidence in the broader nationalist community. The Chief Constable can well do it. He has been uh, reasonably successful in the past year and needs to build on that. We asked the Retired Police Officers Association to respond to the Police Ombudsman's report, but no one was available for interview. Jimmy Spratt joined the RUC in 1972, the year after McGurk's. He's now a DUP MLA and a member of the policing board. He backs Matt Baggett's take on the original RUC investigation. I think very clearly and a very good investigation took place at that period in time. I, I would not be expecting Matt Baggett or anybody else uh, to be going uh, on the public airwaves just simply uh, to say sorry. My understanding is the government uh, and certainly Paul Goggins have made statements about this over the years uh, and very clearly uh, there is sympathy from all sections of the community uh, for the McGurk family and indeed the families uh, who were involved in that most heinous of atrocities. What damage do you think he has done in reacting the way in which he has? Well, I would have to leave that for Matt Baggett to respond to it. Um, certainly my recommendation that he acknowledge the pain <clears throat> that, that 
was caused to the families has put him in a, an awkward position. I, I acknowledge that because this is probably one of many cases. Nonetheless, I think when you apologize and acknowledge you have to do the right thing. I think this is one of the cases and why I made the recommendation that he acknowledge the pain of the families uh, as a result of the police actions. We understand the PSNI has discussed issuing a new appeal for witnesses to the McGurk's bombing, but some of the families will not presently endorse any appeal. At any rate, the man who knows the whole story is holding his silence. Two weeks ago, John McGurk, now a newspaper reporter, knocked on the door of the man convicted of bombing his family's pub. He asked Jimmy Campbell why he's refused to cooperate with the ombudsman or name his accomplices. Didn't want to say to him that I was a victim. I wanted to say to him that my name is John McGurk and I'm a survivor of the McGurk bar bomb and I want to talk to you. He grabbed my shoulder and just held on to it and he grabbed my other hand and he squeezed me, my hand, and just kept telling me how sorry he was. I wanted Jimmy Campbell to reflect upon just how decent my father had been towards him and I was just hoping against hope that it might have pricked some sort of conscience within him because he, he claimed that he was a Christian man. He actually claimed that he thought that God had forgiven him. When he said sorry to you, what did it mean and how did you feel? I don't know if it was the word that I'd been waiting on all my life whenever I, 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 I initially met him. It did mean a lot to me but and I did believe him but I still wanted that sense of you need to prove this to me. I showed him a photograph of my sister and I says you and your cohorts killed her and you killed 14 other people including my mother and my uncle and you affected so many other people and I want you to tell me what happened that night and ultimately when I went out that door I felt that he by the fact that not only would he not answer my questions but he refused to say why he wouldn't answer those questions I felt that he missed an opportunity to save himself that he'd probably never be given again. Four decades after his parents were killed Gerard Keenan still feels raw about his loss. It takes you actually sit where I'm sitting here now at the moment and know the feelings that I have. There's times when I'm driving about in the car, just bang into my head. Well, I'll go down to the graveyard, I'll have a yarn mill so well. That's the only contact that I have now, is that grave down in Middletown. If I said to you, you're more for involved in Harris, you do the same thing as I'm doing. Well, we're fighting to keep our families' names clean and clear of anything which they are innocent of. Their only guilt was their faith, and that was it. Matt Baggett has agreed to a further meeting with families on how best to move forward, but we understand a number of them are considering legal action over the conduct of police in 1971. It's not the first and it probably won't be the last dispute between an ombudsman and a chief constable, but it is a reminder of how the horrors of our past, if left unresolved, will always stand ready to poison the present.